so we're going to have about half an hour of me talking on uh, CLL first line therapy and choices and considerations and then um, hopefully we can have a good discussion on that uh, before we wrap up for today. Um, so just going to progress my slides. So we've already seen this slide today and I, I've decided to hang the talk today around these recent guidelines. Uh, guidelines are always tricky to write because in the field of CLL uh, it moves forward so quickly that by the time that they've been written and out and vetted and everything else we often find that uh, they're already a little bit out of date. I think fortunately we, just at the moment these came out earlier this year um, I think they, they, they're, they're holding up okay at the moment. It may well change in the next few months, and we may touch on that uh, towards the end of my talk, depending on the time we have available. Uh, this slide is complicated, and I don't really want to go through it now. It was shown earlier, and um, this morning, earlier today, we already talked about the IWCLR tr treatment criteria and about watch and wait and what we should do at the time of beginning treatment. Um, and um, Ben has extremely nicely shown us the data on TP53 disruption and um, IGHV mutational status, but along with a lot of other sort of disease profiling we can do. Um, we, um, and I will bring this up about the comorbidities and concurrent medications and patient preferences as we talk through. And these are major considerations for when you're deciding about frontline treatment. And as with any, um, uh, any guideline that we, we, would, we would write, we would always want patients to, uh, and physicians to consider clinical trials at all lines of treatment. And of course, one of the major trials that we've been running in the frontline setting in the UK has been the FLARE trial. And I will be able to share some of the updates we've had on that because we now have data coming from that study uh, presented both at ASH last year and also very recently at the EHA meeting and we can uh, consider that. But I'm rather assuming that we've made those decisions in terms of we have patient, we have a patient or uh, a patient, our patient who we're going to treat, we need to, uh, they've met treatment criteria and just want to really take you through this part of the first line choices and considerations. And so I've taken that bit of a diagram to really zone in on the frontline therapy. And as you can see, this we've divided up into four really quite distinct groups or when, when you're thinking about those patients. And you'll see that we have a column here, which leads to historical chemo immunotherapy, which is what this stands, and then three other columns. And why would you choose one of these three, other, three or four other columns? Well, one, I'm going to talk about historical CIT, but that is what it is. In the UK at least, and, um, um, and anywhere really that has access to BTKI or venetoclax-based therapies, chemoimmunotherapy really has become almost a historical option. Except you'll see in the second column that we do have the FCR option here compared to venetoclax or venetuzumab. And it would be in these patients we're looking at, we're talking about patients who have got no abnormalities of their TP53. They're extremely fit in terms of they have no comorbidities. And they've also got this mutated immunoglobulin status. And therefore, we've said these patients are potentially suitable for FCR. And we can look again at that data again. These two columns are patients who have any immunoglobulin uh, mutational status and are unsuitable for chemotherapy such as FCR. In the guidelines, we've bracketed this with bendamustine rituximab therapy, and we can have a bit of discussion about that perhaps later. And what we're looking at here is either giving BTKI-based therapy, that's being acalabrutinib along with or, 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 with or without obinutuzumab, and of course in the, in the UK setting, we do not have the option of giving it with obinutuzumab, or a brutinib, or these venetoclax-based regimes. And, uh, and this is where we are. So my general approach when I'm thinking about a patient is to think about disease factors, patient factors, and lifestyle factors. And I hope that might come out in, uh, at least as the conversation goes along and in the discussion afterwards. But this is a framework that I would be 
thinking about when I approach uh, needing or having that discussion with patients about what, what treatment they may need. So let's just go through the algorithm and think about historical chemoimmunotherapy in the first in, in the first place. And we've already seen some of these curves before, but I just want to bring out the, the, the most sort of relevant kind of things that I think we need to be thinking about. And it was these two German studies looking at the combination of either fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab against fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, which was a CL8 study, or the CLL10 study, which was trying to differentiate the, um, uh, between FCR and bendamustine rituximab. And of course, it was the FCR versus FC study, which confirmed data, which I think people were already aware of, which had been published in phase two form, but this was the phase three study that really showed this, but showed that Fludarabin, cyclophosphamide in combination with rituximab immunotherapy was a clear winner over FC and also showing here that those patients with the mutated immunoglobulin did particularly well with FCR, um, whereas the unmutated patients did less well, in fact, similar to the FC. And this other study in bendamustine on rituximab versus FCR actually showed that FCR, at least for younger patients, and that was patients under the age of 65, was a better chemoimmunotherapy regime than those patients receiving uh, bendamustine rituximab. And the key things that came, we now know about these studies is particularly how well the mutated immunoglobulin patients, who may, some of them who may actually uh, obtain a prolonged progression-free survival, might even be uh, using the word cure with the longer follow-up of some of these studies today. The other chemoimmunotherapy that we should put into context is the chlorambucil chemoimmunotherapy regimes and the study, which was again another German study, the CLL11 study, which showed that the chlorambucil when paired with obinutuzumab showed significantly uh, uh, improved progression-free survival compared to a rituximab-based regime. And in fact, rituximab did not seem to really add anything to chlorambucil uh, when you look at the two alone, whereas that uh, in combination with obinutuzumab um, was definitely resulting in a, a prolonged progression-free survival. So in the UK, I am certainly not offering chemoimmunotherapy to anyone, but those are the frameworks I need to think about when it comes to patients. But we do still definitely have this option here in our guidelines, that FCR could potentially be suitable for those patients, and those data are the ones which, um, which would, would say why. So why am I an advocate for saying that I do not think we should be offering FCR to patients, that we should definitely be offering um, uh, an alternative regime? And in this column, we're looking at that compared to venetoclax or venetuzumab. And again, I'm thinking about this in the framework of UK practice, but for those patients who are suitable for FCR, uh, um, uh, that is the option that we have through the funding and commissioning arrangements with the NHS. So slightly oddly, I'm actually going to use the data from a study which wasn't a comparator at all with FCR, but in fact, comparing venetoclax or venetuzumab to those patients uh, who had CLL with coexisting conditions. And this, of course, is the um, uh, CLL14 study, which we have regular updates on. And uh, it's on the basis of this, actually, that we were able to access venetoclax or venetuzumab for all patients with CLL in the UK. For those who are not aware, this study compared venetoclax or venetuzumab in this 12-month 12 uh, 12 regime against the chemotherapy, immunotherapy comparator chlorambucil or venetuzumab. The regime is given for a total of 12 months, and uh, for the venetoclax regime, this also includes the six cycles of obinutuzumab, which is effectively eight doses of obinutuzumab whereas the comparator arm was chlorambucil, actually given for 12 months, which is unusual in chlorambucil regimes, along with eight doses of obinutuzumab, um, effectively ending there. And the, the primary endpoint was progression-free survival and a number of secondary endpoints. And this study gets updated very, very regularly. So these patients are untreated, they had coexisting medical conditions, or, uh, and that's shown by the higher SEER score, or impaired renal function, or were a little older. So the patients on average were uh, 70 years old. Um, they had a range of BNA stages. 
it included 49 patients with P53 abnormalities, which is interesting for a chemo immunotherapy study, but they're in there. Um, the patients, um, and this is the latest update on this study. And this shows um, that the progression-free survival for venetoclax or venetuzumab regime was definitely significantly better than that for chloramus or venetuzumab. And this is now the latest update we have on this study presented um, uh, two or three weeks ago. The five-year progression-free survival rate for venetoclax obviously was 62%. And the time to next treatment in the data that was presented actually that at that five-year point, three, only three out of 10 patients who had received um, uh, venetoclax or venetuzumab were needing to go on to treatment. This regime seems to be particularly effective for those patients with mutated CLR, but even unmutated patients are doing better than those patients with mutated CLR who receive chemo immunotherapy. The study is, as expected, has been, I think, very nicely shown with those diagrams. And the majority of patients who are going to need treatment are unmutated. And these, uh, so 60% of the study were unmutated IGHD, and these patients have a median progression-free survival of 64 months. We've seen this overall survival curve being regularly updated, and it's only very recently we've even seen a hint that the curves might be beginning to divide. Now, there are lots of reasons why this might be the case, but you have to remember that nowadays we have so many good salvage options for patients with CLL that this could be, could be the explanation for this. It's just a hint now that the overall survival is in, is, has actually improved for those patients receiving venetoclax or venetuzumab but this is still not significantly different. So here I am talking about comparing it to FCR, and it has only been very recently that we've actually now got data looking at this same regime, the GV regime, in comparison to a, a chemo immunotherapy arm. And this is now the CLL13 study, which has two primary endpoints. And the first readout we ever saw about it was this MRD endpoint at the 15 month time point. And it's got now a co-primary endpoint and we do now have some progression free survival data. The study again is looking at patients who are fit, who did not have P53 mutations in this case, and that would be as expected for an FCR study. And they were randomized either to receive chemo immunotherapy and the majority of patients in the chemo immunotherapy arm received FCR. And that's because they were under 65. So in Germany, you would not receive FCR if you were under 65, which is different from UK practice. And the rest of them got bendamust in the tuximab. And compared to what's called here, the GV regime, which is uh, the venetoclax with obinutuzumab, and two other arms, a rituximab-based venetoclax regime, which we don't actually use, and this is a one-year fixed regime of rituximab uh, venetoclax, or this triplet combination, which is ibrutinib, venetoclax, and obinutuzumab. Patient characteristics are indicated here. And again, the majority of patients were unmutated. Uh, and they were pretty fit. And this is a relatively young cohort. And this is what we saw at the ASH meeting in 2021. And what we found, or what was found in the study, was that those patients who received the venetoclax obinutuzumab regime were obtaining a deeper MRD which was tested both in peripheral blood and in the bone marrow. And there was pretty good co concordance between that. Had much improved MRD compared to those patients who were receiving the traditional chemo immunotherapy. Interestingly, there really wasn't any improvement in MRD for the, the, the patients who received the 12 months of venetoclax with rituximab. And interestingly also, although the GIVE regime, i.e. the triplet regime, uh, appeared to have a slightly higher MRD. This was not significantly different compared to the GV or the obinutuzumab regime. So it appears that there's overall superiority for obinutuzumab containing the regimes over CLT, but no overall superiority for rituximab. So I think this gave us the first hint that perhaps the recommendation of giving venetoclax obinutuzumab as opposed to FCR was the appropriate thing to do in the frontline setting. And we now have some progression-free survival data. This is an early readout. It was shared as a late breaking abstract at the EHAR meeting uh, now two weeks ago. And this actually just can show that actually the MRD was a very good predictor 
of the uh, pro early progression free survival. So the two arms at the top here, here we have venetoclaps of an atuzumab in red, we have the triplet regime in black, and they are doing significantly better than those against the RV or the CRT regime. So MRD results do appear to broadly translate into progression-free survival data. And as you can see, the median uh, progression-free survival was not reached. And those patients who uh, received GV, you know, only one out of 10 of them um, are, are progressing at the three-year time point, whereas that's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's higher for those patients who receive chemo immunotherapy. Again, looking at mutational status, we can see the same pattern, but the mutational status for those patients with unmutated IGHV are generally doing worse with all the regime, but, um, uh, and the mutated ones are, are, are doing better. But if you look at the progression-free survival, certainly unmutated immunoglobulin patients are benefiting from these obinutuzumab, uh, venetoclat regimes over chemo immunotherapy. If you look at the mutated subgroup, and this is the patients who are younger and, um, uh, and only there, they may not actually be benefiting in terms of progression-free survival with these what I'm calling these short-duration venetoclax regimes. You have to remember that this regime is venetoclax only for 12 months. It's a tolerable regime. The there were really no issues, particularly with tumor lysis syndrome. I think everyone's now become much more familiar how to manage that. And I think there's a session tomorrow about how to manage the side effects, for both the Nitoclax and BTKI. Although you're seeing neutropenia, the febrile neutropenia was higher in the chemo immunotherapy arm, as indeed was infections. Interestingly, the triplet regime is also running into problems with infections and, and febrile neutropenia in a way that it seems that the ones uh, just obinutuzumab the venetoclax is, is not, not running into. So VO is very tolerable with decreased febrile neutropenia overall compared to the, both the chemo immunotherapy and the, um, and the triplet regime. There has been a little bit of concern that there might be an excess of secondary malignancies in patients who are receiving venetoclax over uh, other regimes. But actually, this study has so far, and we're only three years down as a, a median, is not showing any concerning, uh, concerning signal as of yet. And just to go back to the CLR14 data, where there's perhaps this hint that there might be a, uh, an excess of secondary malignancies with venetoclax obinutuzumab over chloramycin obinutuzumab, although there's a slightly higher level of malignancies, it's not statistically significantly different. And I think that's something we just need to continue to keep an eye on. But, you know, venetoclax is still a relatively new drug and we need to just be aware that, you know, we confidently, we love the next, the next best thing, but it's only over time what we really start to learn about these kind of things. So looking at these arms, I think the data at the moment is Vano is definitely my preferred approach, and that's even for patients with mutated immunoglobulin. And I'm sure we'll come back and talk about that in the discussion. So, what about those patients who are unsuitable for FCR? So, I want to divide this up into those patients who've got an intact TP53 gene. And that I mean by that, you've tested both the deletion and the mutational status, and there's no mutation and there's no evidence of a deletion. And here you can see that we are looking at several different regimes that one might give. So I'm going to look now most at the data on acalabrutinib, and we've already reviewed the data on venetoclax um, obinutuzumab. Although we've got venetoclax monotherapy here as a potential option, it isn't what it's licensed for, and, and there will be very, very specific and special circumstances where one will be able to commence venetoclax monotherapy in front line. It would only be for those patients who've actually got a TP53 mutation, and they also uh, actually have to be ineligible for a BTKI. So, in fact, in Brutinib in frontline CLL, I'm just put here three key frontline studies which have now um, been updated regularly as well, which really has established a Brutinib in many people's eyes as a sort of potential gold standard. And certainly the US guidelines were actually recommending a Brutinib in frontline for patients. We've certainly never got that far. Um, but, 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 but these are the studies that sort of led us there. 
uh, following on from the original um, Resonate 2 study. And um, the, the study on the right is, is not relevant for the discussion about those patients not suitable for FCR, because of course this is the patient, uh, this is the, 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 the study looking at ibrutinib versus FCR. You'll notice that ibrutinib in many of these studies has been given with uh, rituximab, but when the middle study here, the Alliance study, reported out there was no benefit seen by adding rituximab to ibrutinib. So I think all of us are comfortable when we're talking about these studies, just thinking about ibrutinib as monotherapy. The study on the left is probably the study we should be focusing most on for those patients who are unsuitable for FCLBR, because this was a study looking at ibrutinib versus clarambosol obinutuzumab. And here, actually, ibrutinib was given with the obinutuzumab antibody. And in fact, that study has just been updated. It's now available in, 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 in print in the Hematologica 2022, and showing that those patients who received the abrutinib regime compared to clarence or obinutuzumab, both for mutated and unmutated patients, doing much better than those patients receiving the clarence or arm in terms of progression free survival. So why am I going to move away from a brutinib to an acalabrutinib study? And in fact, if you look at our diagram, acalabrutinib is given is, is, is higher in our hierarchy and what we were perhaps offering in the, um, in the UK over an abrutinib regime. Well, well, let's look at the data first and then we can explore why one, one might choose one BTKI over the other. And it's the data from the Elevate study, which was looking at those patients who uh, are older all had comorbidities um, and were untreated CLL requiring treatment. And this study compared an acalabrutinib obinutuzumab regime to acalabrutinib monotherapy to the clarambosil obinutuzumab regime. And this study's primary endpoint was progression free survival. Again, I just show you here that the patient characteristics, but it was a range of patients. Uh, again, median age was around 70. Um, uh, they, they had a, a good performance score um, and, and required treatment. Again, this study included a few patients with a P53 abnormality. And again, the majority of patients had unmutated IGHV. And this is the latest data cut, and again, um, when one's preparing these talks, you find that these, these uh, data, every six months we get an update and, all, and literally they only just published for months the oncology paper and then uh, a presentation, it's actually all, uh, a poster presentation at EHAR 2022 gave us an even further, uh, for, 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 for further cutoff. And I show you both the progression free survival and the overall survival curve. And it's a PSF which shows that these acalabrutinib containing arm of a significantly improved progression free survival. And I put here on the right hand side the five year follow up percentages over the chlorambosu of an Atuzumab regime. Intriguingly, and it's not quite reached uh, statistical significance. In fact, here the addition of obinutuzumab to acalabrutinib may even uh, result in improved overall survival for this group of patients at this five year follow up point. So why perhaps are we moving away from ibrutinib and offering acalabrutinib instead? And this is just an, a, one of the studies, but uh, there are other studies involving the comparators, uh, uh, involving acalabrutinib, and in fact, the study, which will no doubt get discussed tomorrow, which is looking in the relapse setting between uh, the use of acalabrutinib and ibrutinib has, 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 has also confirmed this. But the rates of atrial fibrillation with acalabrutinib do appear to be lower than one might expect uh, with, 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 with ibrutinib. Clearly, the study still needs to have time to run, but this is, uh, this is um, certainly uh, potentially confirming that acalabrutinib has a reduced cardiac side effect profile compared to ibrutinib. And the rates of hypertension are also lower than one might expect. I think you'll see more of this data tomorrow, the direct comparison between a and a calibrutinib, and also the session considering the side effects of these drugs. But this is uh, also is confirming them. So for that reason, I think the latest data continues to confirm that um, for, 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 for these patients with any immunoglobulin and unsuitable for FCR or BR, 
um, a calibrutinib might be preferable over lifegrutinib. I'm going to finally just show you the data as to why TP53 disruptive patients, we might choose a BTKI over that of a fixed duration, short duration venetoclax regime. And essentially, this is data from the two studies we just looked at. And the, both studies, both the CLL14 study and the Elevate Tumanized data, did contain this small number of patients with uh, TP53 disruption. And um, you can see here that those patients without TP53 disruption are doing significantly better than those patients. And here we're looking at 25 patients in total, two of whom actually um, uh, may have progressed even before treatment was started, um, uh, receiving venetoclax or venetuzumab. Uh, shown their curve seems to be following more of the chemo immunotherapy regime um, for those mutated patients. And the progression-free survival is 49 months, uh, which is still, you know, it's, it's not a bad regime for patients with P53 disruption. But perhaps, and direct trial comparisons are always tricky, but um, perhaps not as good as one might get with a BTKI. And uh, Ben has already shown us the um, small number of patients from the three studies of ibrutinib in P53. Uh, disrupted disease, but this is the latest um, uh, look at the acalabrutinib patients in the Elevate study and showing that these patients, in fact, the median has not been reached and that three in 10, only three in 10 patients have progressed at this five-year time point on P53. So I think it's for that reason that uh, clinicians are probably, and I think you know, we don't have a direct study showing that, but are generally considering that giving um, a BTKI would be preferable for these patients who have TP53 disruption at presentation. Now, in fact, there are ongoing studies, and, we, and we've got an ongoing study looking at that, but the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax, uh, whether that might be more desirable for these patients. So going back to my general approach, and I wanted to keep this um, a, a, um, a, a um, um, I said at the beginning that I would consider disease factors, patient factors, and lifestyle factors when I came to discussing with a patient about how I'm going to approach their frontline treatment. And I just highlight here that TP53 disruption, I think really is a very important disease factor that one should be thinking about when you're considering which way to go and which choice of therapy. IGHV status for me is also important, and I hope the data that I showed you would indicate why. Other genomic findings, I think, as we were discussing earlier, I think, although they may be there, I don't think would be a massive influence on the disease factors which, which make me choose which, uh, which treatment to reach for. In terms of patient factors, clearly I'm talking about mainly comorbidities. And I think the really uh, cardiac history is the, the thing that I, I would want to most, um, most think about. But there are other considerations as to why I would choose a, a, a BTKI over um, or not over, over a venetoclax regime. And as I say, I think the discussion later on and the discussion tomorrow will be looking much more at these, at these um, potential side effects from these regimes and why one might go there. But lifestyle factors, frankly, in frontline treatment are probably the most dominant when it comes to actually having a patient in the consultation room and discussing them. There isn't that much if the choices that we've actually got, we do not have trials in order to say that one regime is necessarily better over the other. I very personally very much moved away from offering chemo immunotherapy to anyone. And in fact, I don't even really, and I think it's interesting what Ben was saying, and I, I think we should have more discussion about that. Do we need even need to have a discussion about chemo immunotherapy for patients if you're not actually going to offer it, even though it's in the guidelines and it's something you could do? Um, but when it comes to choosing whether I'm going to offer a venetoclax-based regime, and that's venetoclax or venetuzumab over a BTKI, and for me, that's very, very likely to be a calibrate when initiating therapy in the front line. I don't have data to say that one is necessarily better over the other. There's a hint that uh, those patients with TP53 disruption may benefit more from the continuous BTKI regime. But hand on heart, I can't actually say that I've got that data. 
So in my practice, I would actually say that disease factors, only 10% of the time has it really become a feature of, of discussion. These patient factors in terms of comorbidities and everything else are clearly important and there will sometimes be things which are crucial and uh, make me think one way over the other. In the end, I think most of the time, it's really having a discussion with a patient about the logistics of delivering this frontline treatment and how it's given that is going to be important. And essentially, when you're looking at a venetoclax regime, you're talking about a fixed duration, one year regime, but the um, practicalities of delivering that are very, very different from the more continuous regimes that BTKI offer. Um, that's sort of where I wanted to bring the talk to today, but I was going to touch further on if we want to have time. And George, I'm going to defer to you as to how you want to go forward, because I could just talk a little bit about um, combination regimes, which are for the future and not for now, and some of the later data that we have from the flare clinical study. So perhaps, George, you could let me know if you'd like. So, Piers, that is a very good point because i think bearing in mind the uh european medicines agency giving a positive chmp ruling on i plus v last week so i think this is going to come in so i th I, th I, th I think i'd i would vote for a few slides on combination because it'll also be a useful springboard brilliant brilliant talk for putting everything in perspective so we've got lots to talk about but could we just have five minutes on yeah. a bit of combination we'll, we'll, we'll I'll off. yeah so I put it as finally. So fascinating what George has just said. Um, the uh, European Medicine Agency has just given a, um, a, 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 a forward. And this is really looking at this study, the Captivate and the GLOW studies, which are uh, ibritinib with venetoclax, given um, for, a, for most patients, it's a fixed duration, 15 month treatment. It's got an ibritinib running and then you get 12 months of venetoclax. But there are an awful lot of other studies looking at venetoclax and abritinib, of which our study, the FLARE study, and I've got a little bit of data we can share on that. And I may say that the uh, regime under uh, consideration is different from how we give it in FLARE, and I will explain that in a minute, but lots of other studies looking at that. We also have some venetoclax and acalabrutinib studies, those with xanabrutinib, and I haven't talked about xanabrutinib at all today. And then this triplet regime, a number of studies looking at that, and obviously we've already, I've already shared with you the latest updates of the CLL13 study. This triplet is not um, currently under consideration for licensing. So why would you give them together? And this is a slide that I've just taken from um, um, Tal's uh, abstract last year, but, but essentially there is good rationale for thinking why the two might synergize quite well. So ibrutinib mobilizes CLL, not only does it cause direct death of CLL, in fact, much of its action is the, 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 the lymphocytosis that we get once you give ibrutinib uh, pushes the cells out into the blood and there they are available to die. Either naturally, because uh, CLL cells out of their protective microenvironment will apoptose, but also if you then added in venetoclax at that stage, you can see that they might be very sensitive to apoptosis and indeed, it brutally sensitizes CLL cells to venetoclax induced, and both of them eliminated. So there's lots of theoretical reasons why they might synergize. And this is the study, uh, which is the phase three study, uh, following on from the Captivate regime, which is looking at ibrutinib and venetoclax in combination compared to chlorambucil-obinutizumab. And um, these patients, again, were patients who were suitable for chlorambucil-obinutizumab, and the regime was in total 15 months of ibrutinib with 12 cycles of venetoclax uh, compared to. Now, in um, um, some of these patients can then subsequently go on to receive uh, single agent ibrutinib, but the studies all vary and, and some of them, everything stopped. So I just think it'd be quite nice just to share uh, briefly with this audience our own study, uh, which was presented at EHA, uh, looking at ibrutinib and venetoclax um, uh, in FLARE, and FLARE is a complex study, and there's already been data on FCR versus IR presented before, but also looking at this ibrutinib versus ibrutinib and venetoclax regime, uh, which is just reported out in terms of MRD. And just to say that the FLARE is actually an MRD-directed study, so in fact, you don't stop therapy until you become MRD 
negative unless of course you are in the FCR arm. Uh, and, and the way it, do, and way it works basically from the one year uh, point onwards, we assess patients for whether they've obtained MRD both in the blood, but also subsequently in the bone marrow. And should that be the case and proven at one year, you would stop therapy at two years. Whereas if it takes up to two years to get MRD negative, you actually stop therapy at four years. So, so this is very much an MRD directed therapy and this just shows the testing schedule. Very quickly, um, this was the FCR versus IR data, which was shown at the ASH meeting um, in 2021. Um, but now we have data showing um, uh, MRD um, uh, at the um, two-year time point when we looked at ibrutinib versus ibrutinib and venetoclax. And in fact, no patient from ibrutinib achieved MRD negativity um, at this time point, whereas quite significantly high um, MRD negativity was achieved for the I and V regimes. Interestingly, this was most, it was most uh, beneficial for those patients who had unmutated IGHV and also those patients who had the, T, um, the ATM deletion. This is not statistically different between the two, but there's a hint that the, uh, this is the, where this regime is most efficacious. And very broadly, these were the conclusions that um, uh, the, the combination resulted in about a 65% negative remission rate at two years. Uh, most marked in those with unmutated uh, disease and those with 11Q. Um, and uh, this is all very encouraging data and it seems to be tolerable. And so it's more data we can back up with the, the GLOW data I just showed you and, and, the, and the previous studies from Everton. So that is my sort of quick look at that just as a sort of, a, um, uh, just, just to show, obviously for flare, we're talking about MRD only so far, no progression-free survival, whereas the data um, with the GLOW study is showing that progression-free survival advantage. That was superb. That was fantastic talking us through not just the options that are available now, but what is coming. And you made a point at the beginning, basing your talk on the guidelines, how challenging it is, isn't it, writing guidelines? Because as you're writing them, uh, Glow is being published, they go for licensing, um, uh, Flair is showing similar data, um, fascinating. So I'm going to, as a springboard in for this discussion, I'm just going to highlight a couple of reflections from EHA and this latest data, and it links into what you're saying. I'm going to reflect on MRD, I'm going to reflect on abinutuzumab, and how these things are influencing our decision making. I totally take your point about patient factors in terms of what they actually want so whenever i'm talking about all the molecular biology and things please remember in my clinics i really do sit down because we we are blessed with choice aren't we but that big division between time limited and ongoing therapy is the fundamental uh crux point of this decision making in the clinics so mrd I love that way, the way you highlighted that the Germans, they dangled that carrot in front of us at ASH, didn't they, with the MRD from the forearms of the trial of their you know, younger patients trial. We've got two rituximab-based arms, we've got two abinutuzumab arms, showing this clear difference in MRD outcome. And we're all saying, well, we've got to wait for the PFS curves, got to wait for the PFS, and absolutely mirrors the MRD data. Um, now, We've seen that before in time-limited therapies, primarily, of course, with chemotherapy, but seeing it with the novel therapy and the different combinations just reminds us how reliably predictive MRD actually is on population-based measures with time-limited therapy, obviously putting continuous monotherapy BTKI in its own little package. But we've seen the same with flare and that data there with ibrutinib venetoclax, which is extremely convincing. And it goes into that unmutated versus mutated territory that we're going to explore. And other things, which I've got to be careful what I'm allowed to say in public, so I'm on the writing panel for the GLOW trial. But this fascinating view of depth of MRD and how robust that is how truly robust these deep remissions can be, particularly in these unmutated IGHVs. And it's back to that 
point when I was putting to Ben about whether you're seeing them hierarchically as different diseases and Ben rightly told me to stop thinking about goats and sheep but you sort of you can't help but be drawn back in when you see this data and think biologically how different some of these CLL patients are behaving but but fascinating so that was my sit my sort of MRD reflection and then the abinutuzumab reflection I love the way you went back to the CLL11 trial there and reminded us where we came from we all had those debates about different dosing the milligrams of dosing, the intensity of dosing, but actually we've put all of that to bed now. We've got these multiple data sets showing in CLL, abinutuzumab really is a strikingly effective antibody. And Ros, rightly, all these, these comments about giving anti-CD20 and challenges with COVID vaccination, but categorically in terms of treating CLL, adding anti the right anti-CD20, abinutuzumab, is really lifting those curves. We saw that with the ibrutinib data. We've seen it with acalabrutinib. And this constantly leaves me feeling slightly uncomfortable that we're not able to offer that combination on the NHS in the UK of abinutuzumab with acalabrutinib. The longer follow-up of those curves seem really uh, quite flat on the plateau. So, so these are reflections of mine. Um, I'm going to I just, we've got questions coming in uh, Q&A from the floor. Um, see if there are any of these which we can deal off quick and then we're going to go over around the panel. So any head to comparison is FCR versus Veno in mutated. So quick bit of comment, of course, the CLL 13 trial, uh, those were two of the separate arms and the mutated are still doing, I think we can say Veno is still sitting above FCR, correct me if I've remembered that incorrectly, um, it, that sub it, 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 it is, but it's not, it's not statistically significant, you know, it's new, they're the same aren't they, but it is above, it is above. Uh, and then the next question for you, Piers, pardon my ignorance, yeah. uh, how is MRD measured in flares? Is it peripheral blood and bone marrow? And I think you hinted at that it's a, a Yeah, compliment. sorry, I probably, I probably went over a little. So generally, um, so in flare, we are looking at it in peripheral blood by uh, flow cytometry. So you're talking about a level of 10 to the minus four. Um, and, and, and actually in flare, what happens is you have an MRD test in blood uh, if that's negative at that level, you have another one. And if that's negative again, you then go along and have a bone marrow. And then we look at it in that and that's, and that's how it's being done. Right. That, 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 that's, that's the trial question. Mohammed Ali, I'm going to come to yours last. We've got another question today. MRD negativity is very low in ibrutinib in spite of being very effective. I mean, it is high risk. It's good surrogate for PS Murano. How good am I doing novel therapy is so surrogate? So that, of course, uh, thank you, Dr. Nayak, um, is the crux that BTK inhibitors with continuous treatment suppress the clone, the patient feels well, the lymph nodes shrink, but in terms of measuring disease, you don't get rid of it. So that is this great catch. And if we go back seven, eight, nine years ago and we were seeing this data, we thought, oh my goodness, just as MRD was being recognized as a valid endpoint for getting medicines approved, I think the FDA approved it or EMA, it was just on that brink of approval. Along came BTK inhibitors that threw the rule book out of the window. But I think whenever you're looking at time limited therapies, the MRD is still uh, validated at every turn. Now, um, I'm bringing all the panel in two takes. So Mohammed Ali asked this very good question. He's basically saying, OK, you're under 60, your TP53 is wild type unmutated IGHV versus mutated, is that going to be making your decision between Veno and BTKI? What a great point to start on. So thank you for those questions. If you can clear that panel of Q&A, we can get more coming in. Piers, that's the crux of the question. Let's forget the patient telling me what they do or don't want. They're saying, whatever you say, doc, unmutated IGHV, and they are... 65 and fit. Are you going to give them a Calamono or are you going to give them Veno? <laughs> 60, they're unmutated and nothing else. Yeah. No, I, 65. I think, I, I, think, I think it's a discussion about, you know, what I don't think I can genuinely say I think one treatment is necessarily better over the over the other in terms of, um, of, of how I'm going to control their CLL, how I'm going to manage it in the future. I'm clearly, I'm thinking they're 65 and they're unmutated. I'm thinking it's likely they're going to probably see both regimes in their time. Um, 
but you know the next one might be when they're 80. <laughs> um, no, co no comorbidities here to influence me anyway. Um, I, I think it's a, um, a frank discussion, but both are highly effective. Uh, I think there are differences in terms of, you know, what, what, what you anticipate. It's going to be a um, more intense, uh, lots of visits to the hospital to start with. Uh, with your venetoclax based regimes, you may well get a infusion related reaction. You may well end up in hospital with that early on, um, but it will be, be manageable. I will end up spending a lot of time fiddling around potentially with dosing uh, them coming for blood tests. My experience of the combination is that patients get cytopenias. I'm either having to dose reduce uh, venetoclax, particularly while I'm giving them obituary or giving them GCSF. And I don't have a particular rhyme or reason which way I necessarily do. And I may say, when you look at the data, um, people do both as well. Um, it will come to an end um, I, um, uh, at, at 12 months and therefore they'll be off everything and that may be desirable to them. Or I can give them something which, you know, will require less intensive uh, interaction with me at the beginning, but I don't know whether it's going to be a problem in terms of the side effects that it induces, which even a trivial side effect may become a real problem if you're going to go on to a medication effectively for life. Um, uh, certainly until the disease, you know, we talk about continuous therapy at that point. Okay. Um, so those are the kind of, I would have that discussion with them. Ultimately, I would make a judgment of which one I thought they were going to enjoy. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to flip to Ben next, but Piers, just before I flip to Ben, my one last question. So, okay, if I plus Ven was around with that unmutated patient is what you've seen with the MRD data and the PFS and GLOW, let's forget toxicity, this one's a fit patient, no cardiac, would that sway you? Would you say, actually, if I'm going time limited, I would go Veni rather than Veno? I think I, I think I would because I like, I mean, biologically, it seems to make most sense to me to give the combination together and I think they're gonna be um, so, but that's not based on data. Mm, I suspect I'd probably align there. Ben, you're itching. Go on, give me your thoughts. Yes, I am itching. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Okay, so we have, we have choices around sequencing. Okay, and, and, I, and I wonder, in, at the moment we've got, um, you know, a, a BTKI followed by a venetoclax or venetoclax followed by BTKI, but we don't have a clear space for the combination of the two. So is... Is I plus V, ibrutinib or BTK inhibitor plus venetoclax, or is it venetoclax plus a BTK inhibitor in terms of how the regulatory framework is going to look at this and place it? So, for example, if we say we, we're going to we're going to have a, a, a suggestion, okay, I'm going to start you off on your acalabrutinib, and then in the future you're going to have a venetoclax-based regime, but is that going to be a venetoclax um, combination in the future? Or do they say, oh, you've already had your BTK inhibitor, you, we're not going to do it that way around? Or is it going to be a venetoclax based regime? And then the regulatory authorities would look kindly upon it and say, oh, okay, you can have your BTK and we can add in the venetoclax because we know we can really treat with that, particularly if it was a, um, you know, a, 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 one of the time limited uh, fixed duration therapies where we can go back to venetoclax as a single agent so that that there is there's this we we call it the therapeutic landscape right but we need we need a set of maps for that so we have cartography and we have the clinical trials but at the moment we we we're able to go out for certain walks but we don't have public footpaths on those uh, you know those areas where the clinical trials provide the cartography for us so we can't go there yet um, so and it's, it just goes back to both of the points that you make about the discussions in the in the clinic, preferences, priorities, and other biological factors, which include the, the renal function, the cardiac function, and everything else. So I think, can we look forward and see how the sequencing works? Because it, it isn't that clear to me, and I, and I don't suppose it's entirely clear to everyone. Mm. Very good point. So interestingly, well, I'll be bringing John in on this point that actually it's the regulatory framework that causes you as much stress. So that's something to reflect on that 
if buy plus V gets approved and NICE says yes, it immediately puts a spanner in the works in terms of what comes down the line. Because of course, we all know NICE are not going to approve I plus V first line and then restructure all of the other lines of approval. That just never happens. So that does create a degree of stress. John, let me bring you on that. So patients, is that something patients themselves are worrying about before us or what's your I, I, I don't think patients, uh, unless they're very well informed, are really into the, uh, partic the particular aspects of, of nice approvals versus what could be available uh, with a regulatory regime. Um, so, so in that sense, I, I think we're just, we, we listen to what the clinician will, will tell us. Now, I know in, when it comes to shared decision-making, over time, the balance within that uh, relationship uh, changes as a, a patient becomes more informed or on, based on previous treatments that they may have had. Yeah, no, no, the, which is a very good point. And the, and the time limited versus the continuous, John, because of course that is the crux of quite a bit of our discussions. Because I'm, I must say, I'll put my cards on the table. An unmutated IGHV is still statistically likely to get five or six years from Veno. That doesn't put me off using Veno. We've given FCR and BR for years, being fairly pleased with a five, six year remission. So I'm not, I'm not in any way put off it. Although we are aware that perhaps continuous PTK inhibition might be a touch better. But I guess for the patient, it's very personal, isn't it? Very much so. Uh, my, my only time-limited treatments were, were all chemotherapy-based treatments. I you know, did my six cycles or as many cycles as I could handle. Whereas I was on uh, ibrutinib for over five years. There was discussion about stopping it. And I said, well, you know, uh, it's doing fine. I'm happy with it. I've mastered the side effects. Uh, I'm living well. So it, very simply, it ain't broke. So there's no need to fix it. But then it started to uh, stop working, to use a, an Irish term, uh, excuse me. But uh, then I, 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 I transitioned on to uh, Benetoplax. Mm. And yes, the ramp up on that was challenging, but we got over it fairly quickly. And I'm now stable on, on that. So, and I don't see uh, an, an end time for that. And I'm quite happy with that because it's, it's you know, quite a minimal impact on my daily life. Just take a few could, pills. Could, could I put to you, John, and tell me if I'm just pushing against the wrong door here, but the, a patient's perception of their therapy depends on their previous CLL experience and therefore inevitably the line of therapy. Because that first line patient who's never been so ill with their CLL and is coming in for the first time, they might have a different view of continuous therapy than the one that's relapsed, been sick, really ill. They take the magic tablets and they've been on it for five years. And I say, oh, well, look, should we carry for another five? And they go, yeah, sure. I just take the tablet. It's quite different yeah. from the person first line. Uh, uh, absolutely. And I mean, the, the person who's, who's first line, once they've got over the, 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 the watch and wait conundrum, so they're now facing therapy, I think what they need or what they're looking for is an effective, that's the first point, uh, side effect free um, uh, treatment, which has minimal impact to their daily life. And if, if they're told that that's duration limited, I reckon they'll, they'll, they'll grab that as opposed to a never ending. Mm. It's interesting. I mean, we've been using a lot of you know, calibrutinib first line now and through the pandemic, perhaps we started younger patients who perhaps now we'd be starting on Veno. And we are getting a few of these patients coming back saying, come on, chaps, I'm totally well. CLL's disappeared. When can I stop it? And we are within the UK. I know there are a lot of international delegates, so this won't necessarily apply to you. But we are shoehorned into this thing that if we stop a cala, if they've been on it for two years in a remission, you stop it we then can't restart it because of this six week rule. And I think that is a little bit frustrating in many ways, because as we all know, there are these two counter arguments. Do you get more resistance by continually, continuously exposing your clone to a selective driver? 
Argument one, or other end of the spectrum, do you reduce the chances of getting a bad CLL by constantly keeping your clone size small, i.e. keeping them on therapy, and don't let that clone divide, expand, and therefore randomly accumulate new mutations? And of course, we don't know. But I have patients in the clinic saying, actually, I'd like to stop. But now, Ros, Ros tell me about this continuous BTK. Do you, do you get pushback from patients or are they just accepting of this? Um, I think. You know, in the in the luxurious position of using acalabrutinib now, you know, the side effect profile is better. I think we still, I, I suppose what worries me in the BTKs is, is the, what the long-term sort of cumulative cardiac risk is going to be. Um, and, um, but it's just so easy for patients, isn't it? They just come and pick up the tablets and start to take them and, feel better within a couple of weeks and uh, it's just a marvelous thing to <laughs> what's, be able what's to not do. to like about that it's, it's, it is it's amazing you know take these pills you'll feel much better in a few weeks and, and everyone does um and you know there's there's an investment with fair now but i think if you know i think if um I always then kind of reflect back to myself you know that's why i was thinking what would i if i was that you know unmuted person you know, knowing what I know, what, what would I do? Um, and I think I'd probably like time-limited therapy just because then you have, uh, you know, and I, and I think, you know, the vaccination issue comes into that as well, doesn't it? You know, are, are you, if you have time-limited therapy and then a significant period of, um, you know, off medication, are you, are you reducing your chances of getting bronchiectasis that's going to, you know, affect your quality of life when you're AFC or, um, you know, there's so many things that we don't know, isn't there? It, it's, um, and, and ultimately, um, it, uh, at the minute, I think, you know, it is in, in large extent what, what the patient wants. I mean, I would say I, I discuss both. And um, in general, actually, you know, often patients choose a calibrutinib just because it's simpler. Most of them are already taking medication for um, hypertension or, uh, you know, something. Well, most older patients have got some kind of long term medication mm. um, and that just kind of adds into it. I think it's as as John said, you know, there's not that mindset of chemotherapy having to be time limited because that's how it's been before. But I don't know. What's your experience of offering the choice? No, no, I, I think all of these, we're all wrestling with the same things. I suspect I plus V will become popular for these unmutators. I think we must remember with caution from the GLOW trial, the toxicity in elderly patients with cardiovascular risk, et cetera, et cetera. GLOW and Captivate had a very different toxicity profile. So that's just a point to flag. But I think the appeal, you can obviously see this appeal of trying to push deeper emissions up front versus this counter argument of is it right to use all your weapons up front and i know we've only got a couple of minutes left but i am going to rotate around the panel members because piers did show us that triplet data we've seen cll 13 i've put my colors down you know i'm not convinced i'd be going for triplet up front but piers your views of triplets do you think they're going to arrive or do you think we're just going to be keeping them for very specific patients I think we're going to reserve the triplet for a particular really nasty genomic and genomic disease that you want to hit hard on the head because I think its toxicity is going to be too high for nearly all. It's just not going to be justifiable for nearly all CLL patients because the other combinations are so effective. So you think time limited, it's going to be Veno or Ven I, yeah. and then open ended will be simple monotherapy BTK. Yeah, I think so. And I, th and I think the trip, I can think of the old patient who you really go, I think the trip is exactly what that, that they're going to be few and far between. Okay, Ben, your views. So, I mean, these, these two philosophies of treatment couldn't be more different. Um, we mustn't forget some of the psychological factors as well. So, for example, at the end of a, a fixed duration therapy, a bit like in, you know, going back to FCR, or even in high-grade lymphomas, um, our, our patients go into a, into a deep remission. We train them about the MRD, so there's a level of expectation in terms of the responses. 
But you know, are, are we going to enter a, a phase of patient-initiated follow-up for MRD negative um, patients so that they are, you know, people are left on their own it, potentially more? So I mean, that those psychological um, effects of of um, fixed duration therapy we haven't we haven't addressed, mm -hmm. but could potentially be dif difficult. Um, and then you know, at the time of relapse. You then say, well, MRD is not important. It doesn't matter. But you told me it did, doctor. Uh, you know, you told me that was the problem. Um, so, you know, it, it, when, you, when you have a different type of treatment, it becomes a false idol, um, which is not to say that it, it isn't the most fantastic thing. And I've, I've stood up there and beaten the drum for MRD over a long period of time. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But, we, but as you say, we now have a different type of treatment which has called the whole thing into question. So I, I think there are, there are massive psychological differences. These two things couldn't be more different in terms of, of, of where they are. And, and that's, that's fantastic in many ways because they may suit some people better than others. So this thing about, well, you're the doctor, can you choose for me? It doesn't wash, we can't do that. Oof, difficult, isn't it? Difficult. Right. Sorry. And then sorry, I know we're just about out of time. Ros, a quick snap phrase. Triplets up front, save them for reserve. Um, I, I think like peers, you know, I can think of one patient at the minute who's, you know, got complex cytogenetics, P53 deleted, uh, you know, about 62. When when he needs treated, he needs something that's gonna try and knock his disease as much as possible. And he's young enough to take the toxicity, but otherwise what what is a bad result with new therapies is still an amazing result compared to what we could do 10 years ago um, yeah good comment good comment now john is it fair me putting you on the spot there as a patient asking your views on triplets up front um well i i, I probably won't answer it in, in in that respect i'm quite happy to answer it uh my answer will be based upon my specific experience rather than generic experience, uh, perspective of a patient. And I would say at one stage in my treatment, I faced no options. So that was a bleak time in the roller coaster of life. But then an option uh, arose and then another option arose. And I think it's really encouraging from a patient's perspective to hear you guys talking about the options and the debate, the analogy you use, Ben, with regard to the cartography, uh, I, I think that's great. Uh, and, and it is really encouraging from a patient's perspective that we have these options because when you don't have options, that is the tunnel that doesn't have a light at the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lovely comment there, John. So now that means we've overrun by two minutes, which breaks all of the rules of chairing that I impose on myself. <laughs> However, the so there is one last question left. Uh... Oh, oh, there's one last. So a cue. The, thank you, Lewis. There is a question. The cue. How does susceptibility to infection affect treatment choice? It is a good question, uh, Dr. Parvez. Of course, each of the different regimens weights slightly differently on different infection risk. And I guess if you have a patient who has a long history of chest infections, bronchiectasis, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you might be moving away from immunochemotherapy. You might be less keen on antibody, um, but and so that might push you to BTK. But of course, all of our treatments, I always say to every patient, some might be less, some might be more prone to infections, but they, any treatment we give for leukemia increases your infection risk. In that perfect nirvana, when you put someone into remission and their immune system reconstitutes two, three, four years later, maybe their risk reduces. But infection and CLL unfortunately go hand in hand. Now, there were so many areas that we could have uh, covered off further and maybe that's a learning point that actually um, the first line treatment requires a bit of an extra uh, discussion area which we will address so I'm going to round off with a couple of things one I'm thanking all of our panel members uh, amazing amazing talks thank you very much Ros, Ben, Piers fantastic and John for your patient insights that were superb